welcome to this edition of Able Dead On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. As always, I'm your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene Seiler. And on this program, we speak to Gary Gordon, Director of Emergency Services for Washington County Mental Health. Welcome to Able Dead On Air. Thank you, Larry. And um, Arlene. You're welcome. Uh, what are the missions and goals of your department and what is a screener? Okay. Missions and goals, uh, well generally our mission obviously dovetails with the mission of Washington County Mental Health Services in general, um, which we serve the needs of our population in our catchment area. We cover all of Washington County and three towns in Orange County, Washington, Orange, and Williamstown, mm -hmm. all are considered part of our catchment area. And we serve the mental health needs of the people in that area. Uh, generally, our philosophy is based on the recovery model. You know, we believe Which that, is what? What is the uh, recovery model? Just kind model? of in brief, um, based on the idea that an individual's um, recovery from an illness mm -hmm. is they're in charge of it. Okay. You know, everybody's individual, um, their needs are different. Mm -hmm. um, we try to work with them to develop um, programs or within the programs and things that we offer models of, uh, of treatment that works for them. You know, we're collaborative with them in their efforts to, to, um, to, to manage and recover from their illnesses. So in general, that's, I mean, that's maybe a, a, a snapshot of it. Um, there's more information about that on our, our website at wcmhs.org. Mm -hmm. If you yeah, want to look we'll close, more closely at the mission, and there's, well. there's mm -hmm. some actually some information there about the recovery model just in general. Uh, we we kind of dovetail with the one that was developed by uh, SAMHSA. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you um, look at emergency services, mm -hmm. um, within that mission, our goal is to serve the needs of people who are in crisis within so our area. Define, if you don't mind because we got lots of time, sure. define crisis. What exactly <laughs> is a crisis or how does a person mm -hmm. get out of, or okay. how does a screener or one of your employees help someone right. get out of a crisis? Well, the interesting thing about that is that it's actually the people who contact us who define what the crisis is. Mm -hmm. But generally, if you're talking about a mental health here. crisis mm -hmm. just in general, um, you're talking about a situation where a person may um, feel uh, emotional distress mm -hmm. because of having to deal with the psychosocial or the stresses of life mm -hmm. or of managing their illness or a, a lot of things can, can I think, um, can cause a person to become in what we call a crisis in which they Stress essentially become, they have a difficulty yeah. um, managing their lives. Mm -hmm. um, they're in a situation where they, they, they are not able to cope, may not able to manage their lives, um, feeling like they have, uh, they need assistance, that they have no recourse, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, since you're dealing with your emergency department, mm -hmm. what exactly is a screener? And how does your screen? How does the screener help within the process of recovery, or okay, help somebody? So a, a screener or a crisis clinician—that's the, the term. That's, term uh, yeah. that's the general term that's being used now. Is a person who will. Um, well, first of all, we have we have a ten-person team. Okay. Okay. There are always two of us on call. Um, and we are all, all called at all, at all times. At all times, 24/7, 365 days a year. The two of us on. Mm -hmm. um, and our role is, if a person calls us and identifies that they have a crisis, then our role is to help that person work their way through that crisis. Mm -hmm. And we do that a lot of different ways. One of the things we do is we we provide a lot of support by phone. Um, we um, spend a lot of time on the phone, actually. Um, wow. We get between twelve and fifteen thousand calls a year. Wow. Twelve to fifteen thousand calls a year. Yes, 
and 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 <clears> most <throat> of what we do is by phone. We do, do see a lot do of people face to face, but we, we spend a lot of time on the to phone. Their, to their homes, to their homes, to meet. Yep, them. that's another thing that we do. We we can. We are a mobile crisis team, so we will travel to places within our area, um, and we will see people on site, and we will do a crisis evaluation on site. And obviously, um, all of this is confidential. Yes, it is confidential. Mm -hmm. It is confidential. Unless, do, does confidentiality sometimes get broken if there's some issues there? No, we don't break confidentiality, but we, there are certain situations where we have to talk mm -hmm. to other people, but it's, it's, it's always within the context of the crisis. So if we need to get, say for example, if we need to get law enforcement involved, we obviously have to be able to talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be able to talk to perhaps our other partners. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by other partners, um, an example might be we might need to talk to a primary care practice mm -hmm. if the person is a patient uh, and, uh, and they're somehow okay, so involved for, in the call. We doctor. might need to talk, yeah. There's we might need to talk doctor. to, um, if it's a child and they're at school, we may need to talk to school officials. So the confidentiality rules still apply, but obviously there are certain people and entities that we have to be able to talk to within crisis. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the law does allow for mm -hmm. that. Now, you know. in terms of the law, well, you mentioned law enforcement. I'm right. just going to ask this okay. to piggyback. Uh, law enforcement is being trained to work with mental and physical, people with mental and physical challenges. Yes. Okay. Do you think um, law enforcement, or, or how can I phrase it? Um, can law enforcement, or does law enforcement get more training when you're working with people that are mentally challenged with, that are in mental health crisis or has that changed somewhat in, within the system? Sure, yeah. Um, so first of all, and I, I don't want to talk too much about law enforcement since I'm not in mm. law enforcement, but mm. I know um, from my involvement with working with law enforcement that they all received training at the Vermont Police Academy Mm -hmm. um, I, I, this, the Act 80 training, you hear that talked about Act 80, is a course yeah. that they take when they're in the academy. Yes. Um, but we also developed, starting around 2013, we developed what we call the Team 2 approach, mm -hmm. where we bring together law enforcement, yeah. mental health crisis clinicians together, mm -hmm. and we train together in how to collaborate when we have to respond to a person who's in a mental health crisis. Right. And right. the reports that we've gotten from the Team 2 training have been very good. We've, uh, there have been several hundred law enforcement officers that have been trained. Wow. This is uh, cyclical, so we go around. Uh, our uh, trainings are happening every, um, all year in different regions of the state. Mm -hmm. um, um, it is funded by, I think, through the Department of Mental Health and Department of Public Safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've been getting very good reviews from both the, the trainers, the trainees, and also we're starting to get information back from the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, we believe it is making a difference. Um, and, and, th and those conversations are also ongoing mm -hmm. um, right. about other things we can do. I'm on the steering committee for the team too. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, we just recently had a meeting where we're talking about other things that we can do to enhance the training, other or, or right. areas that we need to look at. You know, we take input from consumers, we take right. input from law enforcement, from crisis That's clinicians. Good, yeah. um, we also had a, an organization come in and do a survey, um, and we got the results back from that, I believe, last year, and those were all very positive. So, mm. so the, things are being done in Vermont. Um, as a matter of fact, I actually met with, um, and we've also, uh, Kristen Chandler, who, man, who, who is actually a person who, um, who's the driving force behind the team too. She's the one who actually does it now. Um, has traveled, uh, they, she's gone to, I believe, Seattle, Washington. She's gone to California mm -hmm. to talk about the team too model because other mm -hmm. people in the country are interested in it. And I just met recently with uh, four officers from St. Anthony, Minnesota, mm -hmm. who did a peer review with the Burlington Police Department and they were interested in the team two model. Mm -hmm. So we, we think we're doing some things right in Vermont as far well, as, as okay. the collaboration so between law enforcement and, and yeah. mental health so crisis workers. Does person get violent? Yeah, how does Unfortunately, violence... Unfortunately, yes. How does, since we're talking about mental health and yeah. screeners, um, when 
is the jumping point as far as like, okay, if a person gets violent, how does that come into play? How do you deal how do with you that? Cal- how do you calm a person down? Is there a way to do that? Or you just have to like restrain them or something. No, well, they don't use restraints I anymore, know, but do they? Do they have to restrain them or something? Well, for us, um, hope we're not asking bad questions here. But no, no. Um, in, in terms of violence, um, a couple of things happen. So, if if we get a call, yeah, to respond to a situation in the community, mm-hmm. obviously one of the things we're concerned about is our safety and the safety of everybody around us. I mean, that's paramount in our thinking. And if it comes to our attention or during our course of inquiry when we're talking to somebody we realize that there's potential for ongoing violence, then we have to involve law enforcement in that. We cannot put ourselves in a situation where we're not safe. Yeah. Okay. So that means that law enforcement is gonna come with us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're already on the scene. Yeah. Um, And these are the kind of things that we talk about in team too. It is not our responsibility as screeners to stop violence. We aren't trained that way. We're not, we don't have- You're not police. We don't have the authority you know, we, we're not going to go hands-on with anybody. We're not going to try and do any restraint right. tactics. That's really a law enforcement responsibility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually we might be witness to it if we have to be there when it happens. Um, a lot of times it happens prior to us being there because, again, once I say we can't involve ourselves in right, that, right. you know, the situation has to be safe in order for us to be present because our role is to come in and do the assessment, you know, to determine – what the crisis is and what the person's needs are. How, how does the assessment work? Is it a is it a paper? Is it a a, a, a file that you put on the person? Or well, it's, it's a work? procedure. So, and some of that is defined by Vermont statute. Mm-hmm. So, when we go to evaluate somebody, we are looking first of all for the presence of mental illness. Yeah. You know, this person is in crisis. Their behavior says that they're in crisis depending on what the behavior is. Could be a, lot, a lot of behaviors can fall in that definition. For um, example? Oh, an example could be somebody who is um, walking in the middle of traffic, mumbling to themselves and issuing threats. Really? Yeah. Okay. Sure. We had a case recently where a person was actually um, wow. in traffic swinging at cars. Oh, my God. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. so sometimes so, they're off their medication because they could be off their medication, right? Possibly. But Those are things that we'll try to determine. So what we would do in that case is, is first of all, if we see or have information that this person has a mental illness, Mm -hmm. that's the first thing that we look for. Secondly, we look for, is this person a danger to themselves or others? Mm -hmm. Um, Third, and if they meet those two, then is it a person who needs treatment? Are they in treatment? Do they need treatment? Do they need further Mm -hmm. treatment? Mm -hmm. And then, if we determine those three things, then we look at what is the least restrictive, least restrictive means of, of giving them to the treatment that they need. Okay. Define least restrictive. So you? least restrictive would be, um, I mean, is it, is it simply a matter of them needing to take their medications mm-hmm. that they may already have? Then, of course, our suggestion would be, you know, have you taken your medications? Let's try taking your medications before we do anything else. Yeah. Um, if you've taken your medications, the behavior is the same. You're still in crisis. Then it might be, um, the, do you have, need to have your medications evaluated? Are there any particular stressors? What was the precipitant? What caused this behavior? What caused this to happen? Mm-hmm. So we would look at that. And if there's something we can do about that, if a person is in an mm-hmm. environment that is particularly mm-hmm. stressful, mm-hmm. the recommendation might simply be, is there another place you can go to? Is there an alternative place you can go to? So if you are, had a fight with your roommate and it led you into a crisis, is there a family member you can go stay with? Mm-hmm. Is there some other place you can go? Mm-hmm. So, so we're always looking, and, and again, when we talk about recovery and helping people through their crisis and helping them to resolve, and trying to re- resolve this collaborative, collaboratively. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fine. Yeah. then um, we're going to work with them to try to de- help and to get them to help us to determine what would be useful for them. Okay. okay. So in that case, so if they had a family member, then we would contact a family member to see if they'd be willing to accept this person. Then it might be that they need to follow up mm-hmm. with their providers. We might yeah. contact their providers and say, look, this person is in crisis. 
they need to get in to see you, or maybe if they don't have a provider, we can arrange for them to see one of our providers. Um, if it's a situation where we try all these types of things where we're working collaboratively with the person right. and it becomes clear that they're unable mm -hmm. to collaborate because of the severity of their symptoms at the time, then we may find that we would need to um, help them get to a situation where they can be safe mm -hmm. and have their um, and have their and become and have their and become stable. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might involve hospitalization. Or putting it might the involve, person, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I apologize, putting the person on what they call a, a well, in New York or other states, the person mm -hmm. would go into a, what they call a 72-hour hold with they yeah, would stay. but that's a little late in the process because mm -hmm. we're always going to try to get the person, hopefully, to agree to do it voluntarily. Right, mm -hmm. right. So if, you know, if... if our evaluation, if we determine that the person needs to, love, needs to be in a hospital, yes. then we will talk to them about that and we will say why we think they need to be in the hospital. Um, or try to get alternative. Yeah, or an alternative. There are situation. alternatives. We have a crisis bed. There's a voluntary crisis bed system in Vermont, uh, Alyssum, um, over in, um, in um, Addison County. Yes. Um, How and does we, that work within the Well, we will make the referral to them and then yes. they would make the determination whether the person mm -hmm. is, is uh, appropriate for their program. Mm -hmm. They have their own uh, admission procedures. Yeah. Uh, we, we've, we'd either put the person in touch with them or we would contact them ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, if the person agrees to go into a psychiatric unit voluntarily or crisis bed, then we would make those arrangements. We would help facilitate that. If they refuse, mm -hmm. And they're a danger to themselves yes. or others, mm -hmm. then by law we can institute an emergency hold, the 72 hour that you were making reference to. We mm -hmm. can do that in collaboration with a psychiatrist. We can't do it alone. We always have to have a psychiatrist. Yeah. There has to be two, yeah. a psychiatrist yeah. and a crisis worker who, yeah. would, who would institute, so, who would initiate that procedure. So let me get this straight for our viewers. Um, a person can uh, um, accept treatment or not, but if it's an emergency, then you have to come into play, you know, get other people to help within that emergency, correct? If it's an emergency and they are a danger to themselves, mm -hmm. that's the, the, the key thing here is that there has to be an element of dangerousness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sometimes emergencies resolve themselves without somebody in the end being dangerous, and at that point, we cannot compel them into treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's not unusual. We get a lot of calls, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the calls may start out being a crisis. And by the time we're done, we've resolved the crisis, and we've come up with a plan for the person to follow up, or, or you know, because they're no longer, uh, they've been stabilized, and long, and they what might be thought of as a danger may not turn out to be such a danger, mm -hmm. and we come up with an alternative. Um, really, the the idea of putting somebody in the hospital against their will is abs the absolute last resort. It's the last thing that we do. Um, it's the thing that we do the least. Like I say, we get 15,000 calls. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, not even 1% of those go in to a, a hospital uh, involuntarily. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really the last thing that we do. It's, it will, it's, we do it when we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now, um, I wanted to ask this. Um, 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 uh, myths against um, uh, a mental illness. In other words, if your parent has it, does it mean that you're mentally ill? What are some of the myths that you come across? Of <laughs> if someone um, in the family, yeah, if someone in the family has a mental illness, does it affect the, 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 the children? Does it affect children? Does it affect the, the all, you know? There seems to be some evidence. Mm -hmm. um, that there's a genetic component to mental illness. Okay. I mean, we do see it where both parents and children have it, mm -hmm. um, but it's not a given mm -hmm. that someone have, just like it's not a given that if a parent has diabetes that the child would have diabetes. In some cases it happens, in some cases it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, so um, as far as any stigma attached to that, mm -hmm. there may be, and I think I've, I've 
I can say in, in my in my years of doing this, I have heard that, mm -hmm. and people do talk about that. Um, so they're probably, while well, I say that I'm, there is some stigma mm -hmm. attached to that, um, and maybe in some cases even some expectation, which I think is unfair. Because again, what do you mean by that? I mean, unfair. well, genetics is genetics. Um, right. I have brown eyes. My sister might have green eyes. I, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, it's no different with mental illness. No, you know, no. you, you may have it, you may not have it. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, a lot of, I, I know of some cases where the parents are mentally ill and the child is not. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, I think that that is a misconception that's out there. I yeah, don't know how prevalent it is, but it's, it's there. What are some of the yeah. misconceptions around mental illness? Because mental illness, like deafness and some others, are silent disabilities yeah. or silent sure. situations. Yeah. What are some misconceptions that, being the fact that you're in the field, mm -hmm. what are some of the misconceptions around mental illness that people might not know? I think one of the misconceptions is, is that um, that people who are mentally ill are somehow dangerous mm -hmm. or violent or more case. so than the rest of the general population and mm -hmm. the reality is is that they're no more dangerous or violent than the general population that the percentages of people who are violent probably met who are mentally ill will match the same percentage of people in the general population so they're no more mm -hmm. they're, no, they're neither greater nor lesser violent than people who are mentally ill but I think that perception is out there because we've had some high profile incidents where people who have done some pretty horrific things yeah, have been school, quote identified. Yeah, they've been identified as having mental illness. So yeah. you know, the, you know, so but that that's one that concerns me because uh, the majority of people who are mentally ill are just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, um, now, they're in, no different when it comes to in terms of your program. Mm -hmm. um, can a person? I wouldn't say graduate. Okay, they have a, a mental illness yeah. now, but can they not have it later in life, or does it always stay with them, or how does, um, is there consensus to that? I, I don't know if there can be consensus. Consensus, um, I mean, not consensus, like, I mean, not consensus. Um, does a person always have mental illness throughout their lifetime, or does it, can they not have it, um, because you're, your program helps people. So through, through your program, can they um, get? Right, again, it, I think it, it, it speaks to the individual, the nature of the illness, mm -hmm. um, the type and course of the illness. Mm -hmm. um, we do have people who are clients, and they reach a point in their lives where they have achieved a point in their recovery where they no longer need to be clients. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, that does happen. Um, you know, in some cases, so if, if you look at depression, there are cases where people who are depressed mm -hmm. can recover from the depression and maybe not have it again. Okay. You know, um, and when, when, I, when I'm talking about depression, I'm talking about clinical depression, you know. Um, as far as other types of illnesses, I, I just think it depends on the individual, the course of treatment, how they respond to the treatment, mm -hmm. other factors in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in, again, it's a very individual kind of thing. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it seems to be that there are certain illnesses that are very difficult to overcome, such as uh, schizophrenia, perhaps, mm -hmm. where you know, um, the idea that people will completely recover from that um, exists, but mm -hmm. it's it may not. We don't have the same kind of results like that that we would have with depression, say. You know, depression seems to be one of the illnesses that we treat pretty successfully, mm -hmm. whereas we have more difficulty treating a person with a diagnosis like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we can say that because a person has schizophrenia that they will, will necessarily have it for the rest of their lives or that they can't recover. I think the, the big issue is, is that they, they can recover and in some cases live a healthy, functional life, mm -hmm. um, just like people, that are, you know, other illnesses are able to manage their illnesses also and live and be productive. So I think, you, you know, people with schizophrenia, if not a quote, a full recovery, mm -hmm. they can have a recovery mm -hmm. that allows them to live. They can manage their symptoms just like you can manage symptoms of other illness mm -hmm. and live a, a healthy and productive life. 
Is um, there any is there anything within a screener's job that is more difficult than others, and <laughs> it, it's is it hard to really be a screener? Like, if someone was to do this, let's say someone's watching now, right. and they want to become a screener, like, what are some of the things that they should know about the job? That's sort okay. Of thing. Um. It's a thankless job, you know. <laughs> it's not an easy job. Well, it's not easy. Oh, it's an easy job. Is it? No, it can, it can be it can be difficult. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I think is, is noteworthy about the job and that I think about sometimes is the fact that we generally don't see people when they're doing well. Oh, okay. You know, when we see people, they're usually in probably some of the most difficult situations they've been in in their lives, mm -hmm. um, as far as their own their own health and well-being, mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we see um, are things that can really be heart-wrenching. Um, just to see how how ill somebody can be and the the consequences that it has for them and their families. Like if someone, um, for example, can't deal with death or someone dying in their family they kind of crash, right? Or something like that? Uh, well, but more some, you know, people who, um, people who might make a, a lethal suicide attempt, mm -hmm. people who might be um, really ill and put themselves and maybe the people around them in a position mm -hmm. of significant danger, like for whether that be driving driving on the highway mm -hmm. on the wrong side of the highway at a high rate of speed. Mm. Like for example, um, with this whole situation with, and I'm gonna mention it, Anthony Bourdain, uh, the, the chef who committed, okay. who committed suicide. No one right. saw the signs of that. Right. Okay? Yeah. okay. Suicide sometimes, is, like I said, it can be a silent situation. Sure. You don't see signs with certain challenges that you're trying to help somebody with. Right. So how do you deal with that? Okay. You, yeah. Um, well, can we back up a little bit? Because we start out talking about... Um, I apologize. Go ahead. Was, no, 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 no. It's fine. Um, how, um, if someone was interested in being a screener, I think you asked me that. Yes. Um, so if, if you have an interest in the field of mental health and crisis work, um, the screeners require a certain amount of, of both academic preparation mm -hmm. and experience mm -hmm. in the field. Um, and those are pretty laid out pretty specifically um, in terms of like how many years of experience, how many years of education, and the type of education. Mm -hmm. Generally in human services or, or in psychology or social work or some field like that. And a certain number of years of experience in the field. Um, and then there are, you know, there are just certain personal qualities that an individual has to have. A screener has to be somebody who um, can really deal with change um, because things change, things are never the same. Um, they have to be able to manage themselves in very intense and tough situations. They have to be able to manage, uh, be able to establish rapport with people and not just with people who are the subjects of our evaluation, the clients, but also with other providers with other um, agencies, with other people who may be involved, such as uh, the staff in the ER, mm -hmm. um, law enforcement, um, all the agencies that we might have to deal with, family members, those kind of things. You have to have what we generally call good people skills. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, customer service, more, it's more than just customer service. Yeah, we're, yeah it, is, it is more than customer service. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's an element of it. But again, you're, you're also managing relationships with everybody else who's involved. I mean, there can be a lot of people involved in a crisis. Yeah, yeah. You can have the police involved. You can have the, if they go to the emergency room, you have the emergency room staff involved. Their family members may be present mm -hmm. in the emergency room. Um, you may have another agency involved. Like if it's a child, you may have the Department of Children and Families involved. Mm -hmm. They may be present. So a lot of people can be involved in a case. Mm -hmm. um, a social worker or something. Yeah, so, and, so, and so you have to be able to manage 
and to maintain those relationships and, and negotiate with all those different, and, and they may all have different goals mm -hmm. in terms of what they think should happen during this crisis and how the crisis should be resolved. And you yeah. have to be able to, to negotiate that and also be able to, to um, once you reach your conclusion about what should happen, be able to present that to them, mm -hmm. you know, whether they agree with it or not, right. you know. Um, so, and, and so those are some of the qualities that, that you would need to have as a screener, the ability to, uh, to manage somebody who may be angry. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, angry because you got involved in the first place. Um, a lot of times people are just angry because we even show up. Because they didn't, they didn't call us. They don't necessarily think that they're in crisis. So if, you didn't, if they didn't call you, how does a screener then come into play? Someone else calls? Sure, yeah. Uh, our calls can have can come from anybody, mm -hmm. really. Uh, family members, um, uh, police officers, um, um, you know, peace, people passing by on the street. We get a lot of calls from people who just observe somebody with, right. say, say, bizarre behavior or, or behavior that, that concerns them. I mean, we get people call on their cell phones from their cars. Uh, you know, the call can come from, it can come from a business owner who has somebody in their store that's acting yeah. in a way that concerns them. So the call can come from anybody um, at any time. And we take that information. And if we believe that it's a person, you know, if the information that we get on the phone says mm -hmm. to us that this person sounds like they have a mental illness and they're in crisis, then we will go to the scene. We don't have to, you know, and, and we will attempt to do our evaluation. Now, that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean the person is going to be cooperative mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but we do our best to, to engender that cooperation. Um, uh, one of the things that people should know um, is that, and this is, this is interesting to me because as long as I've been doing this, I'm always amazed that this perception still exists, the perception that the screeners are looking to put somebody in the hospital and commit them. <laughs> oh um, say, say that again. Say that again. Yeah, the perception that the screeners are looking to hospitalize somebody against their will and have them committed. Um, two things I want to say about that. Um, the first thing I say about it is, is that commitment is a legal process that can only be done by a judge. So a screener can never commit anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, what a screener does is that if a person meets the criteria that, that we talked about earlier, they can mm -hmm. initiate a procedure where a person can be hospitalized mm -hmm. for 72 hours, okay, um, but the other thing is, is that our mandate of screeners, since our very inception, the screeners in Washington County was started in 1974 mm -hmm. when, um, when Dr. Uh, George Brooks, who was working at the state hospital at the time, actually wrote a grant. He told me this himself. Um, he, wrote, he wrote the initial grant that started what he called the rural screeners. That's what we were known back in the day mm -hmm. as the rural mm -hmm. screeners. The idea was, was to help to keep people out of the hospital. During that mm -hmm. time, back in 1974 in Washington County, 30 people were going in the state hospital per wow. month. Wow. Okay. Within four years, by 1978, with the, with the um, initiation of the screening team, that was reduced to eight people a month. Mm. So it's really our goal to keep people. D is to it, yeah, this was a part of that process. Yeah, yeah, this was a part of that process. And it's really our goal to help people stay out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea still persists that, uh, that, we're, that that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. We're trying mm -hmm. to put somebody in the hospital against their will. So that's more like a myth. People or, or the, do, do people automatically think that when they see a screener, okay, I'm going to the hospital, that type of thing? Sometimes they do. And not only that, but sometimes so do the general public. I mean, a lot of dissatisfaction that we get from the public at large is that they expect us to do that, and they're often disappointed and frustrated when we don't, mm -hmm. um, because they, you know, they expect us to come and take this person away and have them committed. We get those kind of calls. I want my son committed. I need my aunt needs to be committed. Well, again, we don't commit people, um, and and secondly, we're not looking to do that. We're looking to try to help them manage this crisis and to get them into treatment if that's what they desire. You know, a person has a right to refuse treatment. Mm -hmm. They can refuse treatment. It's not against the law to refuse treatment. Uh, the only time we can 
again, the only time somebody can be put in the hospital involuntary is if they meet all the criteria that I talked about before, mm -hmm. the dangerousness being the primary one that mm -hmm. results in an involuntary hospitalization. Okay, now yeah. let's talk about some of the myths. Um, well, um, some of the situations like suicide, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anthony Bourdain, I'm going to mention again. Right. Uh, he, he was found, you know, in his hotel room, unresponsive, and he committed suicide. But how, um, you know, I mean, uh, we can't tell the signs of suicide. We can't tell the signs of certain mental illnesses. Can you break some of that down? Like, um, I mean, why is it that there are certain men mental illnesses that are silent and that, you know, and how does your department come into play with that right. in terms of counseling or screening or? that type of thing. Oh, yeah. Well, um, to the first part of your question, why? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I tell you, I have no explanation. I think if we knew why, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we would, uh, we'd be having a different conversation because the suicide rate would probably be slim to none yeah. if we knew why. Um, in terms of how we interact with that as, as being screeners, yes. um, we get calls frequently Okay. about people who are suicidal. We take them all seriously. Um, and that affects how we interact with somebody. So if we get somebody on the phone who's suicidal, then obviously we're going to explore mm -hmm. what they mean when they say they're suicidal. We're going to explore what things in their environment, maybe we call them psychosocial stressors, maybe contributing to that. We're gonna what look exactly at, is the psychosocial stress? Um, psychosocial stressors are those things that cause you stress that may put you in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in an emotional situation where you feel like taking your life is your option. So a, a psychosocial stress could be losing your job. Um, it could be uh, Wall Street crashing. It could be a combination of things. It could be losing your job. Uh, your wife filing for a divorce. Um, it could be, I'm tired of being an alcoholic. I can't stop myself. The only out for me is to kill my, I mean, there are a lot of things. And they're, again, they're different for in, different individuals. A lot of things can cause the type of stress. Mm -hmm. um, it could be things like you, you don't get enough sleep. I mean, there are a lot of things that can, can contribute to our emotional states and our, and our psychological well-being. Um, and so we call those the psychosocial. It could be all kind of family dynamics. You could be having problems with your family or your in-laws. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be happening that can contribute to a person. And then, and then some of it will depend on your history and your makeup. Mm. You know, if you have a trauma history. I mean, there are a lot of things that, that contribute to what can cause somebody to go into crisis and to, and to come to the conclusion that they need to kill themselves. Mm. Um, so those are things that we would try to, to divine, if you will, from a person when we're talking to them on the phone. You know, we're looking for, first of all, if they're having the thoughts. Mm -hmm. Then we're looking for if they have intent. Do they really mean, as okay. best as we can discern, do they, do they have the intent to kill themselves? Then we're looking if they have the means to kill themselves. You know, if a person says, I'm going to shoot myself, then an obvious question is, do you have a gun? And they say, well, no, I don't have a gun. Do you have access to a gun? And, it, you know, this is kind of simplified. But, and if they, if they don't have a gun and they don't have access to a gun, doesn't mean that they don't have the intent. So it still means that we need to follow and try to get them into treatment yeah. in some way. It just, it just lessens the likelihood that they're going to be able to carry it out. Yeah. doesn't mean that they won't. Um, so those are the things that we go through with the person. We looked at protective factors. What things did they have in their life that will actually help them get through this crisis? And then we look at risk factors. Risk factors could be, uh, could be gender. You know, males commit suicide more than females do. Why is yeah. that? Is there a reason? Um, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, su I'm, I'm sure there are theories on it, um, but the but the the fact is is that male males. The interesting thing about that is is that males females attempt suicide more than males do but males are more successful more than females are. <laughs> and some of that's related to the fact that their favorite method mm -hmm. for men is guns, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so so I, I can't really answer why men do it. I'm at, 
I mean, I've read some things about it, but I don't know if there's a definitive answer. I think some of it, is, is, it would probably be socio-cultural, socio you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, when, when we look at all the things involved in somebody who is suicidal, um, then what we look at is trying to help them, first of all, to ensure their safety as best we can. And that can be a lot of things. Again, we're working with the individual. So because somebody's suicide doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be in the hospital or that we're going to compel them to do anything. It could be as simple as a person is threatening to take an overdose because they've had a stressor, they broke up with their partner, and they don't know what else to do. You know, it's uh, 9.30 at night. Um, so we may, and I've done this personally, how about if I come and take your medications? Just for tonight, I will come to you. You surrender mm -hmm. your medications to me. I will hold on to them mm -hmm. tonight. And tomorrow, we will arrange for you to see somebody. Or tomorrow, we'll follow up with your therapist if you're already seeing somebody, your doctor. Mm -hmm. Or I can leave the medications with your doctor, and you can go pick them up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We do things like that. Um, is there somebody else you can be with tonight who can support you through this? Mm -hmm. um, and we can work out a safety plan like that. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, the person may need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then we will see how they can safely get to the hospital. And then once they're in the hospital, we go meet with them. And then if they need to be admitted and they agree to it, then we can have, uh, I mean, we have the, we do have a psychiatric unit here at Central Vermont mm -hmm. Medical Center. They can be admitted to that unit. Or if necessary, they can, they can uh, remain in the ER or they can go to our crisis bed. Or they can go home if we develop a safe enough plan until there's a psychiatric bed available for them, and we will follow up on that. Um, so that's kind of how that works. And then if they're suicidal and they're refusing our treatment, and we're convinced that they're suicidal, and, and we get them um, to be seen by a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist is also convinced that they're suicidal, then at that point they will be um, hospitalized involuntarily. But again, you know, it has to be clear that they're a danger to themselves. You know, and that they have the means and the intent. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of future goals of your department, like, okay, uh, your department's been around since 19, in the 70s, right? It started, the screening. Yeah, the rural screener started in 74, yeah. Okay. So, knowing that you guys have a vast history and helping people, uh, what are some of the future goals of your department and, you know, future things that you guys are working on to um, make the screeners much better, much better trained, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, we always, we're always, uh, as far as we're concerned, we're always training. I mean, you never know everything there's to know. Mm -hmm. um, we like to stay abreast of the current information and trends. Uh, we encourage people on the team to go to trainings. Washington County as an agency encourages its staff to, to train. Mm -hmm. uh, we encourage people, we send people to trainings, we bring people in-house to train us. Um, so we're always looking to do that. Um, we're, in terms of our goals, in terms of trying to expand services, uh, we're looking at um, trying to come up with, I think, more comprehensive crisis services as far as trying to help people, trying to keep people mm -hmm. out of the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you know, if somebody goes into a crisis after five, the only thing we really have for them, other than us going to them, I mean, we can travel to them, okay? Mm -hmm. We can go to their home or whatever, but if that's not appropriate, then the only other resource they really have is to go to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times, they don't really need to be in the emergency room. Um, because a lot of what happens in the emergency room does not address their crisis. For example, yeah. what do you mean? Well, when exactly. you go to an emergency room, you sign in. Yeah. You have to meet with a nurse. They take your blood pressure. You know, they go through all the medical procedures mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. And, and, and quite frankly, what happens is that's a very expensive way to do things. Yeah. Because a lot of that, you don't, you don't necessarily need a nurse taking your blood pressure. You don't need to talk to an ER doc necessarily about who is not, a specialist mm -hmm. in terms of treating your emotional crisis. Yep. Um, so the idea is, is to be able to, to divert people mm -hmm. away from the ER, which we can do during the day because we're in the office, so people can come to the office and see us. So like I say, we can travel to them when it's appropriate. Yep. Um, 
So one of the things that we have talked about throughout the years and, and, and still will continue to talk about and try to figure out how to do it is to be able to have office hours, if you will, mm -hmm. after five and on weekends and times when it would be when people can come to us if they need to and have their needs met as opposed to having to go to the ER. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a time element involved. When you go to the ER, you might sit for two hours before. You might sit there 45 minutes before you even see the nurse who will even be the ones to call us and say we have somebody for you I'll to see. I'll give you an example. Yeah. I'm originally from New York, and yeah. so is my wife. I, um, sometimes uh, you're in, well, I'm, I know back in the 70s and 80s, you were sitting there like five, six, seven hours before you were even seen. Right, yeah. Here in Vermont, example, I have epilepsy. I had, to, um, I had a seizure um, as soon as I got to Vermont. You know, some, some, the mountains were bothering me, you know. I was in and out in 45 minutes. It wasn't as long as I thought it would be. Sure. Right. Hospitals obviously are working on changing that with, um, depending on, it depends on the emergency crisis, right? It, it, as far as like sure. how long they're in the hospital, so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. Now, in terms of that, emergency crisis, restraining, do they restrain people if they become a danger or have they stopped it as far as? So the hospital has their own policies around that, and, and of course they do have regulations, federal mm -hmm. regulations, state reg regulations about the use of physical restraints. I can't really speak to that. Mm -hmm. What I can say, yes, they do restrain people. Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you about it is that, again, it's the last resort. Yeah. <laughs> last you resort. know, um, but they have procedures around that. They have federal and state laws that govern their use of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very rare that it happens. Okay, very you know, rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's rare. Um, so coming away from this discussion today, people, um, should a person be, like, if they see someone in the street who has a mental, uh, 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 a challenge, if you right, will, sure. should they be afraid of a person with a mental challenge or mental illness? I hate saying the word illness, but right, sure. um, should they be afraid of them? I, I don't think so. But again, also. in general, no, because okay. that, that speaks back to that idea of, of this perception of people who are mentally ill are dang, somehow more dangerous, dangerous than the rest themselves. of us. And that's not the case, okay. you know. Um, Before we end, uh, is there anything you want to add uh, to you being a screener? Because I know that there's pros and cons of everything as far as uh, working. Um, what is um, the positive things about the job and the negative things that you might want to add? Um, you know, the positive thing to me about the job is that I have a job where I'm able to go out and assist people mm -hmm. um, in the, some of the most difficult times of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel a certain amount of gratitude about having the ability to do that and, 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 and um, I, I think that's an honor to be able to, to go out and, and assist people in those kind of crises. Um, and we, we have an environment at Washington County Mental Health where, where um, I've always felt like um, the things that I do were appreciated and encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things that I like about the job. Okay. Um, as far as the things that are difficult about the job, the difficult things about the job are having to help people in a time and in a situation where there's a lot of um, there are a lot of issues around resources that are available for people in crisis. You know, um, and I, I think it's pretty. There's a lot of talk now about the, what some people would say the lack of resources. And, and the difficulty resources. that we have in trying to help people get what they need, um, to me, that's the tough part of the job. Like I tell people, I can deal with the clients all day. The problem comes in, is that after I make the assessment, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get them what they need. Is, the it because, is it because of lack of 
finances or money, or <clears throat> it's just because you can't help? Um, I don't want to lay it all on money mm -hmm. and lack of finances, but um, I think that's an element of it. Mm -hmm. And some of it, I think, is, is that it's still evolving. I mean, we're still trying to figure out how best to do this. And yes, you know, finances and budgets are a part of that because it has to be something that's doable and sustainable. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, um, so that's a part of it. I think another part of it is what we're talking about and kind of alluding to of, 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 of uh, educating the community mm -hmm. about people with challenges so that people aren't so afraid mm -hmm. or so uncomfortable. Yeah. Because um, I think that goes a long way toward helping people with their recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, I think it speaks to that whole idea about stigma and that kind of a thing because um, I think it's difficult to recover in an environment where you're stigmatized. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that has to create a certain amount of anxiety and discomfort on a daily basis. So, um, so those kind of things. But those are, for me, those are the kind of things that are frustrating about the job is trying to trying to link people with the res with the sources that resources that they need or that we determine that they need, and that's not always available mm -hmm. in a way that we feel. And sometimes it's not always available um, in a timely fashion. You know, and I'll just throw this in at the, you know, one of the things we've been dealing with, uh, at least since uh, Tropical Storm Irene, is this, in, is this idea of people, not the idea, the reality of people boarding in the ER. So we have, you know, people who, have, who are stuck in the ER for multiple days sometimes, yeah. are waiting for an appropriate psychiatric bed. Those are the kind of things that, that, that frustrate us. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, the, or not a, is it also not enough staff in the ER, because of example, um, certain hospitals like in New York, uh, Bellevue, I've seen documentaries of horrible things that happen with people with mental challenges in the ER. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm sure it's, it's changed over the years and it's gotten better. Sure. But you want to speak to that real quick before we? Well, in terms of staffing, the first thing I'll say is that an ER is not designed. And yeah. ER is not a psychiatric unit. Yeah. They weren't designed with that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so it puts a lot of pressure on the ER and the ER staff. The, the people who work in the ER are not psychiatric specialists. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there have been some efforts made to address that. I think Central Vermont is doing a good job with mm -hmm. trying to address that. Um, so that gets into the resource issue again. And, and do we need to have alternative? And that, again, that's what I was talking about in terms of our goals. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we should have, and I believe we should have an alternative to people going to the ER. Yeah. You okay, know. We said you have to him from my you know, I, we should, and there are some states that have alternatives to ERs. They have facilities that people can go to yeah, in a mental health yeah. crisis. Yeah, Not yeah. really an institution because it's, it's short term. Yeah. So instead of going to an ER, you would go to, for lack of a better term, I'd call it a mental health urgent care. Yeah. 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 You yeah. know, and your mental health needs are met. You yeah. know, and they're met efficiently, and all of the people around you are people who are well trained to do that. Yeah. And you don't have do to deal with the kind of issues that you deal yeah. with in the ER. Look, mm -hmm. look at Ray. Look at Ray Charles. What he went through. He took the oh. drugs and he went to this rehab center where they had to help him get off of it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I it wasn't think wasn't easy for him, but he, he, he <laughs> was like provoking. Yeah. It was like yeah, and that's part of the problem. I mean, these crises aren't particularly easy. Yes. Yeah, they're not. You know, they're well, not. we would like to thank you. For thank you. Us on this thank, edition. thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, for more information on Washington County Mental Health, you can uh, log on to their website www.mhcs.org. Um, That's w um, w c m h s w c w c m h s dot org. Is right. there an emergency number? That the emergency can? number is two two nine zero five nine one. That's Two two nine zero five nine one. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Able Then On Air, and see you next time.